<laughs> so I, I guess I want to just comment that so the richness of this presentation for me is connecting a field of research to our field, and the and the importance of that it can't be uh, uh, spoken about enough. Uh, and I also want to obviously lift in dispensing of existence criteria of thought reform is this, this point exactly, that a mind control group says if you're no longer in the group, you cease to exist. And even it's OK to kill you in some of the groups. So it's, there's, there's a lot of overlap here and a rich, a, a rich area. Would you, would you mind putting mine over there? Actually, leave it, leave it. So can I can I start? <laughs> I'd like to introduce Steve. <laughs> Steven, can I just pass? Can we? I thought we can just take them down the rows. Go ahead. While people are sat, I think it might. Sure. Be cool. Well, so most of you have heard of me from this book from 1988. This is the 1990 paperback, and I'm happy to say that I bought the rights back to my own book. And I have updated it substantially. When I wrote this, I was really writing from my own experience. I was recruited into the Moonies at 19. So I was mostly talking about my clients and people that I had helped who had been born in normal, quote, you know, non cult environments who got recruited. I did mention, I think, once or twice people who were born into cults. But we really put a lot more attention to this subject in the new combating. And in fact, we tell stories of ex-Jehovah's Witnesses, ex-Mormon, and Gina Titania, who grew up in TM as well in this book. And because now I, I own it, I can actually add more stories uh, as, as well uh, 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 that I really want to do. Um, and I originally, I thought I had two hours to present my approach to helping people who've been born into high demand authoritarian families or cults. Uh, but I have basically an hour and 10 minutes. And I want to do interactive, uh, but let me get through some of the, the key points to set the stage, if I may. Um, does everybody know that I was in the Moonies? Do I need to even say that? So I was in a cult, and that's how I got interested in these cults. How did you get out? I got out because I fell asleep at the wheel of a van and drove into the back of a tractor trailer truck at 80 miles an hour and was in the hospital for two weeks with this operation on my leg. And it was during that period of time that I had uh, sleep because I was sleeping three to four hours a night. And I was away from the group for a couple of weeks. And I actually called the one person I was very close to my, all my life, my older sister Thea who had never said I was in a cult or said I was brainwashed. She was always, I don't understand, I love you, I miss you. That was, that was her message throughout my involvement. I reached out to her. She said, you have a nephew you haven't seen. I want him to know his uncle Steve. Come and visit. I had a cast from here to here. I said, if you promise not to tell the parents and my older sister Steph, because they were Satan, because they you know, spoke out against the group. I said I can arrange the visit, and fortunately she broke her promise, <laughs> told my parents, they hired the programmers. There was a five-day intervention. The story's all in chapter two of the book. Um, and I basically had an intervention with former members that taught me about uh, thought reform, mind control, brainwashing. And I was a, a true believer, idealist, who thought he was going to follow God and wanted to save the world. And as they went through the criteria of Chinese communist brainwashing, it was clear that the, the Moonies, the family, is what the cult members refer to it as, were doing all eight criteria. And it caused the snapping moment for me where I kind of woke up and realized Moon wasn't the Messiah, the Armageddon wasn't going to happen in 1977. And I started to cry, and I was very confused. And I spent a long time reading as much psychology books as I could, because I wanted to understand mind control and brainwashing. And it was really Robert Lifton that I credit for this career that has evolved over 39 years, because he was an Air Force psychiatrist who had been tasked to study Chinese communist brainwashing in the 50s. 
And when I reached out to him, he said, what do you want to talk to me about? I said, thought reform and the psychology of totalism. And no kidding, he said, that old book? That was his first words. I said, yes. He said, why? I said, because I just got out of the Moonies and your book saved my life. I met with him. He more or less, after listening to me describe how the Moonies recruit, how they, the three-day workshop, the seven-day workshop, the 21-day workshop, etc. He said, you know, I've only studied it second hand, but you lived it. They did it to you and you did it to others. So you need to study psychology and explain it to people like me. And in, in, in terms of therapy, this is called a reframe. <laughs> I went from a college depressed, you know, college dropout who had been in a cult, had his tail between his legs, was so embarrassed to this eminent psychiatrist and professor at Yale saying, you know something valuable. And here I am so many years later. So um, I'm presenting what I've been doing uh, with clients. People literally fly from all over the world and come visit me in Boston. I basically do a marathon one week with people. I've learned over the years that with this level, especially with people who are born into groups, one hour a week, you can do 10, 15 years and not really get to the core issues, whereas six hours a day, one, three in the morning, three in the afternoon, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, we can change the world. People can literally reclaim their power. So I'm presenting what, what has been titled as the freedom of mind way of doing things, and so that's what I want to share. So that's the plug. So this is the, the first book to read if you haven't read any of my, my books. And this is the book that is my approach on strategically helping people, other people get out of hybrid groups and cults. These are just some of the problems that people face who've been subjected to mind control, thought reform, brainwashing, extreme identity confusion, dissociative states, panic and anxiety attacks, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, lots of psychosomatic symptoms, including headaches, backaches, all kinds of issues. People have ty typically have issues with decisions. They are, many times, they are just so much younger than their chronological age. Like their emotional development was retarded. Their psychological development, especially if they were forbidden from going to college and getting higher, higher education. Tremendous amounts of guilt and fear, sleep disorders, nightmares, eating disorders, sexuality issues, which I spoke about yesterday, money issues. The universal problem is lack of trust. Trust of self, trust of others. Uh, we talked about the delayed or retarded psychological development, harassment and threats. Some groups do that. We, this was a great presentation on, on ostracism, but it, this goes even further. Reading loss of friends and family, rape of the soul. So this is a question, it used to say, how would anyone know if they were under mind control? But I've updated it to the legal term undue influence, because the law accepts the concept of undue influence, but it doesn't accept the concept of mind control yet. But it's basically the same thing. It's the exploitation and, and, and manipulation of power of someone who has less power and someone who has more power. But this is this is the key question. If any and for anyone at any time, no matter whether you're in a relationship with a boyfriend or a girlfriend or a boss at work or a religious organization or a political organization, whatever, how would anyone really be able to know? is the question. And because we have a very limited amount of time, normally I, I do long pregnant silences and I ask people to tell me what you think and we have a whole dialogue, but we don't have time. Oh, so this uh, is just, this is the what we call the Earth, except it's really a water planet. Interesting. This is the perspective from out of space. I, I, I like to use this slide because uh, in many ways the problem of blind faith is solved by perspective. And I think when we're talking about global issues, we need to look from outer space and realize we're on one, one beautiful planet in a 
countless galaxies. It's amazing. I have a friend who's a radio astronomer studying a black hole. It's incredible. In any case, perspective is very, very important. Uh, does everyone know the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights? It's on UN.org. Highly recommend. Well, I won't have time to go through them all, but when you're born in a mind control cult, you don't know these things. Like the, this, this is your right. These are people's rights around the world. Like you really need to study like what is healthy and normal. I won't have time to go through it. So. This is um, a graphic that's in the new book in chapter three. I think this is one of the more important uh, slides. Uh, and what I'm trying to, 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 to have people look at is the fact that influence in and of itself is not bad. We do influence all the time on each other. And as parents, we have to influence our children to help them to grow. But there's healthy patterns and unhealthy patterns. <laughs> You know, and most groups are in the middle. <laughs> some are leaning more towards healthy, some are leaning more towards unhealthy. But through the use of the bike model, which is my model based on Lifton and Singer's work and others in the field, I, I organize um, a model for how to look at any particular situation or relationship in terms of behavior control, information control, thought control, and emotional control. You should have a handout. And by the way, it's on my website, freedomofmind.com as well. And I have 100 free videos on my YouTube channel and on my website as well. But for people who grow up in an abnormal <laughs> environment, part of the healing is you need to know what's, what's normal or you need to know what's healthy. Because you can never get healthy by just reacting against what was unhealthy. You have to know what's healthy and practice it and internalize what's healthy. The very key point. And the theme is respecting the uniqueness of each person. Their individuality, their free will, their conscience. And the groups that we're all concerned about, they want to they want to clone people. They want to make people a, a stamp to make them think the right way, feel the right way, act the right way, internalize the doctrine, internalize the leader, and do what they are told to do. So it's all about dependency and obedience as opposed to free will <laughs> and conscience. This side is about love, it's about honesty, it's about transparency, it's about accountability. This side's about fear, fear, phobias, fear, a little bit of guilt, a lot of guilt, shrink shame, to make people do whatever the leader wants. Does that, does that make sense? It's very important for people who are born into mind control cults to be able to have an intellectual understanding first, because ultimately, you know, that's the behavior control. I'm not going to go through the whole, the whole thing, because you can read them all. But tr not every group does every single one of these, but the more you can tick off, the, the, the further it goes that away. Um, that, I have so little time and I want to focus on healing strategies and I want to presume that most of you know the basics of my work. If you come back to that, um, come back to this. So another thing to think about with that other graphic, this is another one from chapter three of the new combating, is this notion that that, that the cult is different at different levels, that truth changes depending on where you are. And in fact, most members are down here or even out here, not living in a compound, but are nevertheless being influenced. And there really should be lots of elements coming out here. And I just came from a conference in Toronto on Scientology with my friend John Atak, who was an OT5, if anyone knows anything about Scientology, he, was, he had attained a very high level on the bridge to total freedom. But he was, he was an independent, he was, a, you know, he was a public. So he was living by himself, but, he, but he, had, he, he had a filament here, right directly into his brain of the belief system of the group. But it's, it's, it's an organizing principle that's important for you to understand, too, because 
some people will look at uh, Tom Cruise or some, some person and say, how could they be under mind control? And they may be here, but they're linked by mind control. Their, their, their personality, their identity has been taken over. And of course, there were people there at the conference who had been born into Scientology. Incredible abuse. So here's a key, here's, now we're into the core of this presentation that I wanted to get to. The way to recover from destructive mind control is for you to be in control of your own mind. It sounds simple, but it, it takes a lot of energy and effort and knowledge to do what needs to be done for you to reclaim your personal power. So part of what I do and what support groups can offer is a toolbox of techniques and strategies. What's great about former members is they, they who, who have gone on and gotten to a higher place of healing is to share books that they really liked, movies that really helped, strategies that they found that was useful. And we can really support each other and help each other. And of course, as a therapist, I come up with what I think are some of the key things. But a lot, of, a lot of people say, but I didn't have a pre-cult self. That's what I kept hearing from the people who read my original combating book, because I talked about you know, the real Steve Hassan got suppressed by the cult Steve Hassan, and then I got deprogrammed, and I came out. And people who were born in cults were like, I don't have a self. I don't know who I am. And they're, they're right in that sense, that they, everything of their identity was tied to the cult. But what I can say definitively, having done this work for 39 years, is my belief and my experience that people are born with an authentic self, mm -hmm. even if they're in a cult. Yeah. There's something in the DNA that we want love, we want truth, we want goodness, we want meaning, we want connection in, in our soul, which also helps to explain why some people who are born in these most extreme isolated groups can't stand it as early as they can remember and want to run away. Mm -hmm. Like it's, it's, it's a phenomenon that needs to be take, um, uh, identified and, and, and taken advantage of. So who, who am I? Many times people say, I don't know who I am. I, I, and this is 30 years ago. I say, well, who do you want to be? And they'd be, oh, I don't know. Well, are there any, any books you've read where you like the characters, any TV shows where you like the per personalities? Like, shop around and see what <laughs> resonates with who you are. Oh, I like the artist. Okay, maybe you are an artistic person. Or I, I like, you know, mathematics and engineering. Explore. Find out what resonates with you, what, what, what floats your boat, what, what feeds your passion. Uh, and do a lot of exploration and lots of trial and error. <clears throat> it takes time to figure out who you are. Anyway, in the real world, if you had the healthiest family, that's part of growing up, is finding out who am I? What do I believe? Where's my place in the world, etc. When you come out of a mind control cult, you just have to do the work. You may be 50 years old, but you still have to do the work. And, but I'm encouraging people to know you can be your own best therapist. You can be your own best friend. The locus of control for your mind and your body needs to be inside you. As a therapist, I can share what strategies I work did for myself that helped and what has helped other people, but there's a whole toolbox and there's not one size fits all. So if you just keep trying different things until you find out what works for you. And in your healing, different different things may be in order. So it's not a static thing. Oh, I read that book, so I'm done. Uh -uh. It's an active process. So balance, mind-body connection, developing your inner potential. And I say, look, you got to be in your body. Like one of the, the thing, the, 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 the categories of, of uh, in the DSM of mind control and cults is a dissociative disorder. And the definition of a dissociative disorder is you're disconnected. You're disconnected from feelings, you're disconnected from thoughts, you're disconnected from ego states, however you want to. You need to start with 
being in your body and liking being in your body. A lot of destructive cults don't tell you your body's evil and it's terrible. And so if that's the case, if you grew up in a group like that, you're going to need to have a new belief about my body's nice. <laughs> my body is the external manifestation of my being. And that my body has wisdom. This is a lot. We'll get to some of the we'll talk about psychosomatic illnesses. I can't tell you how many people have had illnesses. I was at this conference in Toronto, and Hannah Whitfield described having the most intense migraines, crippling migraines, it stopped as soon as she left Scientology. Imagine that. I was like, did you ever think of consider the possibility that it was your unconscious or it was your body saying? Get out of there! <laughs> <laughs> not, not really. It's like, trust me, I've been helping people get out of cults. Their bodies are saying, wake up! This doesn't work. Uh, oops, I lost a bracket. But live in the present. Be in, in, it sounds trite, but be in the now. Like, be in your body, be in your breath, be in the now. So many people are spending a lot of their emotional time and, and cognitive time thinking about the past, the past that they can't do anything about, or worrying about the future that hasn't happened yet. And modeling healthy, functioning people, you want to be in the now, primarily, thinking about what's within your control to do something about. We talked about the locus of control inside your body. Emotions are our friends. So many of these cults try to label what are good feelings or bad feelings, or do thought stopping or emotion stopping. If you, if I'm feeling homesick, oh, that's it, you know, block that out. Emotions are our friends. They tell us stuff. We should pay attention. But we also don't want to be taken over by a friend either. And if we have an emotion that's overwhelming, that means we need to pay attention, but not be taken over. We need a, to develop a perspective on what's that emotion about, and what can I do to, to change myself, to change my circumstances, so that it gets more into this balance, this healthy balance that I'm talking about. And so much of cults, cults are about black and white, us versus them, you know, good versus evil thinking, perfectionism is, you know, there's a perfect way to be a member, supposedly. Got to get rid of that belief. Get rid of those, please. And, like, use the a model that says, hey, I'm a human being. You know, we learn, we grow, we do trial and error, we make mistakes. Hey, relax, breathe, grow. Join the rest of us, <laughs> people. Seriously, because if you leave a, a totalist cult and you still are thinking that way, that there's one truth with a capital T and there's one right way of doing things, you'll drive yourself crazy. So we ta I talked already about the authentic self. People are born with the authentic self. And I want to comment uh, about a psychiatrist uh, that I've studied with over the years named Claire Frederick, who talks about center core phenomena. If anyone's familiar with her work. But she believes in teaching people self hypnosis very, very early on in her treatment. And she believes in inner archetypal states. And as I listened to her recently, I went, that's so congruent with my teaching about the authentic self. But she, she basically says, you know, we have an inner wisdom that we can tune into and we can rely on and helps people access these, these powerful resource states, which she calls center core phenomena, inner creativity. And there are other parts as well. Um, I'm going to stop and do questions and answers soon, because I feel like I, I don't want to overload too much. But coming back to need for love, the need for truth and meaning, the need for connection with others, and something greater, the hope for a positive future. Um, this is a book I highly recommend. I use it in my work all the time with former members. The uh, uh, woman who wrote it, Molly Koch, and that's her website, mollydkoch.com. She's been teaching parenting workshops for 40 years, like how to raise healthy kids. And for people who are born in mind control cults, they don't know what 
what a healthy childhood is supposed to look like. Maybe they have some guesses. Maybe, maybe they had the good fortune of, of meeting people who are, who are healthy. But I highly recommend reading this book because she really she teaches people how to parent. And in fact, one of the best strategies that I'm aware of for people who've left destructive cults is raising kids, not in the cult way. <laughs> because in parenting, they're, they're reparenting themselves by that process. So it's a really wonderful book. And this is another book that I learned about last December at the uh, Child Friendly Faith Project Conference. Uh, I met this man named David Cooperson, who uh, spent 32 years as a child protection advocate, social worker, helping kids who've been uh, physically abused, etc. This is the definitive book, very small, on why hitting kids is bad. Like really, 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 really bad. For, for child development. Really, I, I got convinced. Like, <laughs> totally. I have a 12 year old, and honestly, I never liked doing a thing like that, which I did a couple of times uh, with him. But after I read this book, no, never again. But And I was listening to uh, Tony McClear. Uh, Talk uh, at the conference who was who got into uh, uh, Aryan nations and white supremacy groups, and he described getting getting beaten as a child because he was dissociating, he was having pain, and it was training obedience. It wasn't encouraging him to develop his own self and to reason and to and to behave because of an internal locus of control. It was more like do the right thing or else you're going to get. Uh, uh, the crap eating out of you. I highly recommend reading this book. Actually, my, my uh, co-presenter talked about Maslow's hierarchy of needs. This is important stuff that people need to know, like what's normal. And when people first come to me, I want to know, are you safe? You know, are you in a living in a safe environment? Because of many people who are still living in the cult, they're not safe. They're like living in an enemy war zone, hiding. It's not a healthy environment to get well. You know, a lot of people aren't sleeping properly. All kinds of major issues. I'm going to speed ahead. Another model to look at is uh, Eric Erickson developed the concept of identity. And he said a long time ago that people need to go through these stages of development in order to be healthy. And what when you're in a growing up in a mind control cult, you're not able to do the normal developmental growth process. So Eric Erickson's uh, this is a photo of my first wife who passed away, unfortunately, who developed the theory based on Erickson, but basically saying Erickson was a guy, and so his model of identity was about guys. But uh, there's a feminine side, too, and we need to consider even guys have a feminine side. And so she talked about, about a social <coughs> thing that, that needed to happen as well. So this is her model, and I can, it's, I can give you her website. But she talks about a communion stage, so trust me, she's, she's talking about bonding versus withdrawal, which later, she wrote this in 91, this, the hot field is attachment theory. I'm just plugging her about on the back of that. Oops, I think I'm done with, with the PowerPoints. Um, so coming back to, um, let me go back to the front. Um, <coughs> The note, oops, I want to go back to the slide that says, be in the now, be in your body, take control of your life, take control of your mind, know what's healthy and normal, and learn to parent yourself, learn to heal yourself based on the now looking to a healthy future, not just reacting to a destructive past. Healthy future. And when you are in a mind control cult where you've been programmed with phobias your entire life that the world's coming to an end and that you are in Satan's world, you, you really need to know that that is bogus. <laughs> you know, it's one reason why I like Stephen as a 
clergymen saying, this is not what Jesus would do. <laughs> Jesus would not do ostracism, please. Like, if you're going to quote the Bible, do it properly. Uh, Love-based love religion versus fear and guilt-based and with that, I want to open it and have dialogue because we have a little bit of time because I have so much more I could teach. Yes. What's most helpful to you in your coming out, in your recovery? Normalization. Uh, what was helpful for me? Yeah, most helpful. So the thing is, is I was 19 when I was recruited, and I had a pretty strong, healthy childhood. And so I, I, I had a really good support system. So I could tell you what worked for me, but it's not exactly the focus of what I'm supposed to be talking about, which is helping people who are, who are raised in groups. So for me, it was, it was needing to reconnect with who I was before. And I had a very distorted memory of, I thought I had a very abused childhood, and I had forgotten a lot of, of me. And I needed to watch movies, and I needed to hang out with friends, and visit places, and play basketball, and like remember who I was. But I had a lot of support to remind me of who I was. And it took me a full year, I would say, to even get my, my mental faculties. Like, I was a, a English major, and I used to love to read like books after books after books. And when I first came out, I couldn't even concentrate. And I couldn't even remember the meaning of a lot of words. So I had to like sit with a dictionary and teach myself again the English language and just get my brain like a muscle exercising. Uh, yes? I was just going to say, it's not, it's, it was just something that when you said about worrying about the past, worrying about the future, mm -hmm. I saw something a while ago and I thought it was wonderful and it was, uh, worry is the price you pay now for a debt you may never owe. And I thought that's really That's true. nice. <laughs> So I just, sorry. Nice. And a key notion is what's within my control, or what's within my sphere of influence, and what's outside. And focus 90% of your attention on something you can do something about, as opposed to worrying, what if Scientology sends somebody, da -da 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 -da, it's like, I drive myself crazy. I lock the doors, I have an alarm system, I have a good relationship with the police department, I, I do what I can, and the rest, if something else happens, I may have to have more security. But other than that, focus on what I can do something about. Yes? Uh, to what degree, in your opinion, can a regular therapist who knows somewhat about mind control help with the process for SGAs of rediscovering your I'm biased. I really think former members who become therapists have a distinct advantage um, emotionally and just in terms of ability to empathize and such. But there are really empathetic therapists who are willing to take the time and effort to learn and come to conferences like this. And, 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 but I can't tell you how many people have contacted me who are so frustrated that they'd be paying their therapist and educating a therapist. Right. Yeah, right. And they, they should be paying someone to supervise them. Mm -hmm. A therapist should be paying someone to supervise them and not you paying them to educate them, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Like, that's backwards. Mm -hmm. Did you want to say something? I did. Um, I was wondering what you recommend for SGAs who become parents themselves. Um, you know, I was raised in a community, um, probably not as extreme as some other ones, and I consider myself fairly well-adjusted, however, I have things to work with. Um, I have a four-year-old now, and sometimes wonder, is there something I'm overcompensating for? or any? any it's a great question. Um, so the number one rule that I tell all my clients is work on yourself, get yourself healthy. Because the best thing parents can do for their kids is for them to work out their stuff, uh, as opposed to putting all the attention on the kids. Um, secondarily, learning about what's healthy and normal, uh, getting a good therapist uh, who's educated. Um, so I, I hadn't planned into going into this, but I might as well. There's a, a whole approach to helping people with uh, early attachment disorder issues that involves a hypnotic process of creating an ideal mother and an ideal father 
and revisiting key traumatic moments in your childhood and asking your creative self and your wise self, if I had the perfect mother and I had the perfect father for me, for my personality, what would I have wanted them to say or do in that context? And just allowing the imagination to fill in the, the blanks and it has a profound impact on people. And I can tell you that the, norm, the, the average immediate reaction when people hear me describe that is, yeah, but you're, you're making it up. And what I want to say is what we've learned from neuroscience is how incredibly powerful our, our, the neurogenesis, the neuroplasticity is for us to create experiences through our imagination. I mean, that's part of how cults recruit and indoctrinate people so powerfully. But with the locus of control is within you to create experiences that are nurturing and loving and filling in if you were not getting the attention from dad that you wanted to have a, a, a new construct that you reparent within yourself of a father who's there for you, that you can talk to, who's willing to teach you stuff. It builds a new, it, it tunes into your, that DNA of your authentic self and helps you align to a healthy future based not on trauma or on neglect or on torture, but based on healthy nurturance, uh, boundaries, safety, um, uh, security, uh, attention, uh, touch, etc. And I'll give you a quick example. This was during one of my uh, trainings by Dan Brown, who's one of the preeminent psychologists in the world. Uh, did this training and he showed a videotape of a session he did with a client. This woman was uh, being asked to, to go back and repair an incident where she woke up as an eight-year-old screaming from a nightmare. And what had happened was that her parents yelled at her and told her to shut up and go back to sleep and if she doesn't they're going to come in and hit her. That's what happened. So in trance, he brought her back to that moment and said, now imagine you had the ideal mother and the ideal father doing exactly what your personality wanted and needed at that moment. Tell me how the scene develops. And she says, oh, so my mother and father come immediately into my room and they turn on the light and my mother sits by my bed and she puts her arm around me and says, honey, I'm here for you. And she says, it was just a nightmare. And my father sits at the bottom of the bed, and he's, he's touching my leg and soothing me. And then my mother sings a song. And then my father goes to the kitchen and, and makes warm milk and brings back more. And she's doing this whole scene. We're all like, whoa, that sounds great. But she comes out of the scene after you know 45 minutes to an hour, instead of always remembering that horrible traumatic experience, she has this wonderful bathing experience of love and safety and security for her inner child who is still traumatized. And on, again, on some level, it's magical, but she's creating her own healing. The therapist isn't telling her what to do. He's just saying, now imagine you had the ideal mother and father. And people come up with different needs in different scenarios. And it's not like, not like you have to do that scene one time. You can do that scene 15 different ways if you need to. But the point is, is getting to a healthy place with a healthy sense of identity. I know who I am. I know what works for me. I know, you know what, what's good, what's not so good. Um, act, acting out of autonomy and I'm moving towards a healthy future that's going to bring out my potential. Do you have a book or a therapist who works with this? Uh, Dan is actually working on a book. It's not ready yet, but feel free to email me, depending on where you're living. It's really kind of the cutting edge. As I, and I believe me, I've seen a lot of different therapy uh, modalities happen over the decades, but this this feels right, and I've done it myself. 
because I didn't have a perfect childhood, even though I had a darn good childhood. I didn't have a father. I'll give you an example. I had a, I, uh, I have a, this is, this is a little, little window into Stevie, Stevie's uh, mentality. I had a, a, there was a test, it was a statewide test, and I got a 97 on it out of 100. One other person in the state got a 97. No one got higher, and most of the people flunked in the state. And I came home and I said, Dad, I got a 97. He said, what happened to the three points? <laughs> I'm not kidding. He actually said that. And I had to redo that one. <laughs> you got a 97? Really? Oh, come here, buddy. <laughs> Let's go out for ice cream. Yo, dude, proud of you. Uh, and I'm fortunate because my father lived long enough that he was able to say I love you and hug me and say all those goody things. It took decades. This is something you do within yourself that's not dependent on people in the real world. Francis. Uh, there is a book of, uh, of Erika Schopnitsch. Uh, I don't know the title in English and the Dutch, but she's done, uh, she wrote books about the child work. Uh -huh. And that's uh, very powerful. Uh -huh. I, I use it. Okay. So maybe you have some, some books if you've read them and like them, please feel free. The point is, is that we are free. Our minds are amazing. And life is good. And, and, and this is, a, you're on a journey of healing. And, and for many of, this is another issue that I haven't touched on yet, but many of the people who are born in cults were ostracized. Their family and friends are still in the group. And, and they try to maintain contact, and they wind up getting re-traumatized when they try to talk with the, the, their family and friends in the group. And um, I, I really want people to focus on their healing, and once you're at a really resourceful place, if you want to think strategically, how can I help you know, family members or friends, there are techniques and strategies, and part of it, some this is a plug for this book, the strategic interactive approach, essentially, it's creating an ethical influence program to get people to think for themselves. It's not to get them out of the cult, it's to get them to tune in to their authentic self and feel their own feelings and have their own thoughts. Because if they start doing that, they're going to leave too, for sure. And you need to be creative. But with the internet, there's lots of possibilities. So it's a very exciting time that we live in. Other comments? Yes. Hi, Steve. Uh, going back to the idea of you know finding a therapist or something like that, I think when I left, I was so destroyed that I didn't know um, I didn't know I had been in a cult. Right. I, I could also be a kind of a common experience. You just so very common. Just out. naming what's wrong yeah. is a huge step in the right direction. Right. So I I I um, actually. Um, so I think the first step would be, you know, my first reaction was, get the hell out of there. Right. You know, so I mean, get away from what's hurting you or what's damaging you. And then I was looking, I was looking to find someone who was a very good listener. Yeah. Uh, empathetic. Yeah. And I think he was also nurturing. And that, I think that was helpful too. Mm -hmm. Being a human being. Yeah. It's huge. And I, I talk about mini interventions, like I was in the Moonies one day, it was really, really hot, and this, you know, one of Satan's world invited me in and gave me a cool drink. <laughs> it was nice. I mean, I remembered that when I came out, because it was countering the indoctrination of how people are in the world. And that's why I want to encourage people when they meet cult members to realize, you know, there but the grace of God go I, or this could be someone's sister or brother if I have five minutes and say a nice word or do a nice gesture. It can, it really can help a lot. So the, the good news is, in my opinion, I came out in 1976. There was no internet. I was, it was scary. It was just, it was a different world. With the 
the internet, you can go into Facebook group and look at videos and stuff. It's so much, I think, I think easier now for people to find connections. And I wanted to also say a common pattern always when you're saying, I didn't know I was in a cult, is just to learn about other groups. You know, to, and that's what's happening now. There's a lot of publicity about uh, Scientology. There was a Going Clear documentary. Uh, Gregorio Smith did the Truth Be Told about growing up in the Jehovah's Witnesses, which if you haven't seen that documentary, you should absolutely it's go online and, and watch that. If you start studying other destructive groups, it, you can say as you're listening, oh, that was like my experience. Oh, that wasn't like my experience. Oh, that was like my And it can help you process your own experience. It's very useful. Yes, Russ. Uh, Steve, part, part of the issue, which is good in your taking back your own mind, is that, to use an Indian expression, it's like peeling an onion. You get through that layer of the cultic bad stuff, and they say, oh my god, there's this whole other layer that set me up for the cult from my family. Then you start peeling that. Where do you stop without spinning out of control? Oh, so that's a really good question. So one mistake, so I do trainings of therapists a lot, and one, one error that therapists often do is they, they, they have the person sitting in front of them and they go back to family of origin stuff first. And you got to deal with the cult stuff first, mm -hmm. like the here and now stuff first, and really arm the person, give them an intellectual understanding of thought reform, mind control, hypnosis, really understand it and work backwards. The, one of the most powerful techniques that I ask my clients to do once they have that fundamental education uh, that I typically give them, even if they've read a billion books before me, I go over what I think are the key things that they need to know, like the Ash Conformity, the Milgram Obedience Study, the Zambara Prison Study, etc. cetera, um, is to ask them to go back in time, and if they were born in a cult, to their earliest memory. If they were recruited into a cult like I was at 19, go back to before you were recruited and remember <coughs> how you were recruited, as if someone was watching from, from a video camera. So in other words, not from your first person perspective, but if you were looking at yourself getting recruited. And then go back in time and go back in your body to the earlier moment and say, if I knew then what I know now, how would I act differently? <laughs> What would I say? What would I do differently? Does that make sense? So in my case, I was recruited. I was at the cafeteria at Queens College. My girlfriend had dumped me. Three women were flirting with me. I thought they were interested in me. I, I, I had no idea that they were involved with a group of any kind, much less a religious group. And when they said, in the barn principal, I'm out of here. Anybody else want to go? Come on, everybody. Let's leave. <laughs> I needed to do that exercise. Why? Because I was going back into my cult identity and liberating the younger Steve who had been programmed. Because the real Steve would never have allowed all that crap all up. Oh no, you can't go to sleep. You have to stay up for three days. No, the but research says you need seven to nine hours of sleep. I'm going to sleep. Oh, you won't let me? I'm out of here leave the cult. Just over and over. And you get stronger and stronger because you're reclaiming your power based on what what your authentic self says is real and what's important and what's good. But yes? How, how does that work if you were born and raised in it? I mean, you know, I can think back to instances when I was a child where, oh, that would have been wonderful if I stood up and been like, this is ridiculous, why, you know, why is this happening? But that would have set off, you know, some events that would have been very unpleasant for me, so would that help someone like Right, but this is an exercise in imagination okay. based on the goal of your healing in 2015, whatever day it is, it's June, what? June whatever, it's you. So you get to use your imagination. So if you have best friends now who are ex-members, you get to transport them back in time and you're younger and they're taking care of you. I mean, you, you, you can use your imagination, but the point is, is, is giving the younger you whatever you felt she needed or he needed at that time. 
And the bottom line is how, how you feel and whether you're more functional as a result of it. That, that's, that's the test. More questions or comments? I could, okay, please. I, I'm struggling with something in, in my process. We want to do with the positive experiences. And Great question. Yeah. Um, yeah. Great question. So part of the, the healing process for me is not throwing the baby out with the bathwater. So, I mean, it's a thank you for your question because of or your comment because it's very, very important. It's very important as you go back in time and own whatever good happened or, or whatever growth happened while you were in the cult. No matter what they were doing, you were still growing up and, and learning and growing. Some people learn languages. Some I learned public speaking. I was a very shy, introverted you know, guy who wrote poetry and within a few weeks of being in the Moonies, they put me on stage. And I learned platform skills. <laughs> like, when I left, I went, I know how to speak on stage. <laughs> I want to talk against this group. <laughs> they are evil. I learned how to run a business. I, I, knew, I know in my mind I can exist on seven days without food. Because I fasted several times. I mean, I learned discipline. I learned that I, there was a lot of, I, I had experiences, I was trained in martial arts in the group, um, and I had experiences that are crazy, but they're useful in certain contexts. For example, I was um, mugged in Harlem. I had a guy put a knife in the like this in my belly demanding my money and I was so programmed that I would be giving him God's money, I would be bringing sin on his soul that I looked him in the eye and said no, I can't give, I can't give you God's money, it will, it will wreck your soul and he's like give me your money mother. I'm like no I can't and he was like this and I walked away and but I learned I learned a str I learned a strategy of mine. You know, I mean, I'm not telling anyone to ever do that. <laughs> but it, I mean, I had a lot of crazy experiences. But so, but you want all the good things that you can use in some context. Um, so that if that if that answers your question. More comments, or everyone knows everything they need to know about how to heal. And, oh, question. Question about recovery, but organizing how it's possible to think that you had a nice pyramid picture. Yeah, there was a top picture, and then there was some other way. Then there was some other way. in my mind when I'm analyzing people where they recruited in or where they born in because a lot of cult leaders were in a cult themselves mm -hmm. and you know so they were they're, they're not the public likes to imagine or, or project that the con, con artists decide one day I'm going to start a cult and <laughs> and it's usually not that that's not usually how it is um, but for me the issue it is what would an analysis do for you, or how will that help you recover and such, personally? Because that's the framework <coughs> of this. Oh, well, I mean, how uh, the, the top leader leads the organization. Somehow, those top leaders, they, they should have a the incentive to stay, to stay in, in the group. And so the bike model kind of, you know, covers it, and basically the only people who get to the top uh, are doing what the cult leader wants in the way the cult leader wants it, and is pleasing the cult leader, 
And so there's rewards and punishments. And then on a whim, the cult leader can kick someone out and demote them or move mm -hmm. them to another location. Um, I'm not sure if I understand your, you know, what you're, you're trying to uh, get at in terms of your question about sub-leaders. How, how does that help you recover right now? Were you a sub-leader? Because I can talk about if you are a sub-leader and you're out, typically you have a lot of guilt and shame over all the abuse that you did. That's Yeah. Yeah, do you want to say anything? Oh, well, um, as a woman in the Hare Krishna movement, Usually women are just delegated to either collecting money or working in the kitchen. But I became really arrogant when I was in the and I felt Well, because you were being cloned after the leader. I became arrogant, too. Yeah. And the higher up you go, the more narcissistic you become. You're your really cult self. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you see yourself as that? Do you see yourself when I'm really arrogant? Or not when it's happening. No. No, you just feel superior because God chose you. I mean, I was being told to choose what country I wanted to run when we took over the world. <laughs> okay, I was 21 years old. <laughs> in Australia, I'd have my own continent. <laughs> it's worth laughing at. But I... Uh, he would walk in the room, we'd bow to the floor, he was the lord of the universe. By the way, I would highly recommend, it's on the internet, a BBC documentary called Emperor of the Universe. It's about the Goonies. If you want to have a little more fleshed out vision of what I was subjected to and what I was in. And it's, again, it's really good strategy to watch things like that because then you can go, that's really a cult, you know, that's actually, you know what, let me take a moment since you have a little bit of time, I'll show you three minutes of that documentary. Uh, up there's a picture of the anchor. Mass wedding, people are being assigned, men and women, identical dresses and suits. They don't know each other, they can't even speak the same language. Oh. That's the Bible of the group, you know, it's the Washington Times. Let's see if I can I can try to play this. Let's keep our fingers crossed. The lights off. They're by the they're by the door, I think. They're by the the front door, I think. Checked in the previous day around 8 a.m. The young man's death stirred belly a real interest in until it emerged. You should listen to it at least. He lived on the I was indoctrinated on that. His father was famous, a modern day messiah. He was a great teacher, he was a great author, and the messiah. Ten times greater than Jesus. We see him as the Lord of him. who failed. The first person coming is God's representative. A convicted felon, he controls wealth beyond the imagination. Oh, yeah, and this might be the too loud in the other side. He is the drive, the need for power. Where's the Kuma? Sorry, Jay. Yeah. 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 Sorry, it's a church. Yeah, can you close the door? Also because there is some Anyway, it's just another one minute. Yeah, they did, I guess. No? Yeah. They're following this person. That's trouble with the two of us. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
say in their prayers is crush Satan. Out Satan. Is my friend out Satan. Out Satan. So this is online. You can watch the whole thing. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Mary was crowned Messiah in the Senate office door. Right, mm -hmm. I remember I will play. Oh, that's me in 1977. <laughs> <laughs> you had some kind of money. Yeah, you wanted to ask something? Well, I was just, you were talking about which country was going to be yours in the world. And I was my first personal assistant, and I used to think to myself, statistically, what are the chances that I'm in this tiny little group that has the highest truth? The right hand man. No, you were obviously yeah, thinking a lot more than me. <laughs> I was just believing. I was just believing. I, I, I literally was trained to do thought stopping. That if a doubt about Moon, the doctrine of the group, I would chant in my mind, crush Satan, crush Satan, glory to the peace of Two parents, two parents, two parents, in my mind. Like over and over and over. So I didn't, when people said, did you have doubts? Not after the first three months. Uh, yes, and then you. Does that, I did that with feelings, and that's why recovery took a long time. I would stop all negative feelings, fear, anger, hatred, anything. Oh, so that's a whole other thing, actually, we can cover. Uh, but you, did you want to say something? Yeah, angry reports. Uh, yeah. Are you aware of any legal remedies um, that can be chewed against? the guru, leader of cults or whatever, uh, for uh, psychological, mental, financial damage to the very truth? Uh, I think we're working on that. I write about a new model that Alan Shefflin developed called the social influence model, which is directed towards lawyers and judges and juries, how to analyze an undue influence situation by looking at the attributes of the person who's the target or the victim, attributes of the agents of influence, so the cult leader, etc., and then the techniques and methodologies used to influence, which includes the bike model and lift and, and hypnosis and other techniques. So he's put a framework together that needs to be fleshed out, and, and kind of like we were learning about so-called optimism theory, that needs to start getting plugged in to establish a scientific basis to give judges the ability to, to see that. Um, so to answer your question, depends on which country and what, what the law is, but it's one of our goals is to empower us former members and whistleblowers to right the wrongs, and also in my country, US, to take away tax exemption status for groups that are systematic Violating human rights. Yeah, that's a good idea. That's a good idea, totally. Uh, especially Scientology. Um, so let me just talk about triggers and some of my lo a longer. There's Robert J. Lifton, who changed my life, and Robert Charles Meany. All of this is in Chapter 4 of Charles Dennis, Margaret Singer. Uh, forgive me if I don't have a quick way of getting to the... I love to show, I can, I'm not going to play this because of the noise problem, but Darren Brown is a hypnotist um, in the UK and he does a lot of hypnotic demonstrations mm -hmm. that are all unethical, but I like to use his videos because I'm not allowed to do unethical things, but I can hear he's getting this woman to become uh, catal cat catal catalytic? Catatonic, thank you. Where she can't move her legs or her arms or even speak by using the power of words and hypnotic suggestion. Uh, and those, that was a training you can use sign power the triggers. So, this is a very early piece of the toolbox that I like to teach my clients. And essentially, a trigger is an automatic reaction to any stimuli or a cue in any of the five senses or combinations of the five senses. So seeing a picture that you were shown in the cult might trigger your programming to come up. 
Uh, I know for XJWs, they're so drilled about Armageddon, or to, you know, every earthquake, every tsunami, every plane that goes down, that it triggers typically some of that programming. And um, I don't know if this is the slide I want. So basically, again, to repeat, uh, and learning helps with repetition. The goal is to be in your body, be in the here and now with the locus of control for your life within you, where you have a toolbox of techniques to be yourself. So to deal with triggers, the first step is realizing, hey, I just got triggered. What just happened? Oh, somebody used the word moon. What, well, what happened when they used the word moon? And this is going back to 1976. Oh, I saw myself kneeling in front of Father, you know, during one of his lectures. I don't want that. I'm out of the frickin' cult. I don't want to react every time I hear the moon. Now, the average, tech, the immediate technique that people, just for survival sake, use, uh, with triggers to avoid the stimulus. So, for example, if they're in a Bible cult, they can't stand to be near a Bible or hold the Bible or open the Bible. Carol, you know, so they avoid. What I am saying to people is you want to think about normal people. Like if you were never in the cults and someone said the word moon, what would happen in your mind? Oh, you'd see the moon. <laughs> in my case, I would, before I met the moonies, I see the satellite that goes around the Earth in my mind, right? So if you can understand the, the trigger, and you understand how you want to react to the trigger, then you can intentionally pair the right reaction, the right picture, the right emotional state to that, based on who you are and who you are now. So, moon, and eh, moon, eh. moon, half moon. Quarter moon. Over an hour, people would say, moon. I'd think of the moon. It's that fast. We can learn faster than rats and mice and dogs. We need to use our imagination and we need to use our intelligence. Um, the worst thing you can do is avoid the stimuli. And there, I'm telling you, I've met people who, you know, they got out of a meditation group and 30 years later, even though they love meditation, they're afraid to meditate because they're afraid it's going to bring up mm -hmm. the cult stuff instead of going, you know what, let me find a different type of meditation, let me create a new context, let me go past my fear, <laughs> let me have new associations so that I can have the resource and the tool. Same thing with the Bible. And the best thing is exposure therapy, a way to get past fears. And, and the thing about fear is understanding you need to use your critical analytic mind to say, is there really danger or is this, a, is this an irrational fear? Right? So if, I, if you go to a train station and there's a sign, do not step on the third rail that has 100,000 volts, you should be afraid and you shouldn't step on it. If somebody takes a piece of chalk and draws a line and says, don't walk on that line, you'll get electrocuted, you should be able to use your intelligence to know that chalk does not conduct electricity, there's no electricity in the carpet, and it's fine, and go over and walk on it. And test reality. Yes? It's just uh, reflecting on uh, how uh, we have triggers in our speech, our daily speech, and, and how we don't even think about that. So, uh, the, a, a word like Muslim is a trigger. A word like Christian is a trigger. It can be. Is a trigger. It can be a negative trigger. Yeah, that, but if I, it's a positive so trigger, I, that's good. We like those. Yeah, but the, the point is that, that we use the word, these words in such a broad way. The, the word new age, we talked about that when Margaret was saying uh, this uh, So, um, do you have a recommendation as to how we you have to reclaim the language, and especially if you're in a cult, if you learn loaded language in the cult, you need to come up with different terms. And again, I just came from a conference with ex-Scientologists, and they take the longest to recover from Scientology. One major reason is that part of their indoctrination is something called study tech. 
and a new word clear. What the hell does that mean? It means that Hubbard wrote that as you're reading things, if you space out or get confused or don't agree, it's because you passed a word that you don't understand the definition of, and you have to go to the Scientology dictionary and learn his definition of what the word is. So people are doing this to themselves, thinking that they're getting free and becoming clear, but they're getting more and more hypnotized and more and more programmed. And there are people who left the cult 30 years ago and they're still using the loaded language. And when they get together with ex-members, they're each triggering each other with the loaded language. And when I say, cancel, cancel, you got to get back to the English language or whatever language is your normal language and get all of that cult word jargon out of your brains. And it takes some time, but that's really how you're going to heal. Seriously, I, I swear, one of the women in, in the uh, in the Going Clear documentary, horrendous abuse. We walked out of the session together, and she was on the phone with a friend. And she said, "Oh, you wouldn't believe the end thing that's happening. It's incredible." <laughs> that's a loaded term for bad, bad energy that's against Scientology. Mm-hmm. And she's talking. She's been out for decades, mm-hmm. and she's talking end theta. Hello? That's yeah. not a normal word. <laughs> yes. We are in the group I was in, and the music. Music? Oh, oh music. Oh, my God. In a sense, music. There is a music, a healing type of music, created by the leader himself. It was always there, and after leaving the group, it took me like seven, eight years to eliminate this sound from my mind. Uh-huh. Every time in night I waited, waited for traffic light, I all of a sudden I realized the sound was you know, there in my mind. That's a great example so of a trigger. So I how we could um, eliminate that. So that is this music uh, that, that the cult leader uh, made, or this is using regular songs in the cult mm-hmm. context? Well, in fact, he made uh, his music himself. He used it for therapies. Oh. But also, during our stay in the facility, day and night, or was there like background music mm-hmm. only. Mm-hmm. Right. And so music, that's what he said, this music is used for two different moments. Yeah, so, the, so, so music is one of the most powerful indoctrination tools that cults use. Mm-hmm. In, in the moon cult, they have holy songs, and you, members would sing, I don't know how many, at least one to two hours a day of these songs, which all were you know, reinforcing the ideology. I know the JWs have song books as well. Um, so the bottom line is, neutralizing the triggers. If you feel like it's intrusive and it's causing you lack of sleep or it's causing you to have agitation, then you need to, you might need to work with a therapist, but what I might do with you or a person who has this kind of thing is to have them, remember I was talking about imagining going back in time, uh, knowing what you know now and, and altering the past to go back to the first time you heard the music and say, this is cult music, I don't like this. You know, I turn it off and I'm leaving. So that might be one strategy to use. Another one, so the bottom line is you need to exit yourself, your younger self who is in the cult, out. Um, the other thing is to just, you take the music, you get the tapes or whatever, and you listen to it deliberately pausing in very short periods of time, making a new association. Mm. Like taking a picture of the cult leader, you play a few seconds, you throw a dart. <laughs> <laughs> a few seconds. <laughs> or whatever you can think of, you know, some people burn pictures of the cult leader or step on, or, you know, I, 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 I would, have, and, you know, have all kinds of creative fantasies about what I would like to do to moon and live, uh, as part of my healing. 
But the key is, the, the biggest thing is just realizing I'm having this trigger and I don't like it. And it's interfering with my functioning. Once you understand that, try different things. And if you can't figure it out, find someone who can help you. But I'm telling you, the universal is just understanding basic learning, which is put a new behavior, a new association to something. <coughs> so um, one technique I've, I've used with people who are uh, in like guru situations or whatever, and they would have this incredible um, one down feeling whenever they saw a picture of the guru. So I'd have them visualize the guru as six inches tall, you know, or the guru in, in diapers. <laughs> <laughs> so that it, it dethrones the pimp, it dethrones the cult leader, or talk like that the duck. <laughs> because if the call leader is threatening you go to hell in Daffy Duck's voice, <laughs> so you're an idiot. You jerk. Um, these are great questions. Keep keep asking. Anyone else have more questions? Yes. Uh, in my personal healing process, it was also important to appropriate the field that uh, I was uh, being abused. Uh, it's just like someone who has been raped and after when this person wants to have sex, the very act of having sex is reminding the abuse. Right. So uh, uh, one, of, one part of the healing process, I in my opinion, is to reappropriate because yes. the, 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 the group uses so Abuse is from the, uh, something who was good, yes. Mm. And we we shall not let them uh, win on the, uh, 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 you know. Agreed. So uh, that, that, that just was. Yeah, no, it's thing. it's huge. So you reminded me of another technique someone asked me about my healing techniques. So I showed you an image of the Divine Principle book, which I used to lecture. I was drilled in that, and then I lectured it to people, I needed to read it, cover to cover. I needed to read the Bible again. I needed to see where everything was taken out of context. I needed to know where he had stolen ideas from other places. I needed to read the history of God by Karen Armstrong. What wasn't? And in my case, I had first heard of the concept that God has a feminine side and a masculine side, or a cult, which to this day, that that resonates with me. I, I don't want to think of a god as a guy or some kind of male force. But I needed to go back in the history of religion and understand Moon didn't come up with that idea. So I, I, even though I, I learned it there, I can, I can now attribute what, something that is useful to another place and such. Um, I, I needed to read through Moon's speeches again because I had been in trance while he was lecturing for hours and hours and hours and as a leader I had these these non-edited transcriptions of his speeches and I needed to see how crazy he was. And part of my healing, and this is an important uh, point as well, and partially because I was a leader and I did feel guilt and shame over things that I had done and I had helped this, this cult leader get a foothold in the United States, I felt a need to help others get out. And it was something that my father was very upset and begged me not to just like leave it go, move on, you've lost a few years, move on. I was like, but dad, I, you know, these are people I know and I want to help. And I realized he, my, my parents were traumatized by my involvement in the group. And for them, they wanted the nightmare to be over. And just knowing that there was danger because I was speaking up against this billion dollar group, uh, this horrible group. But I, I had to face my authentic self and my conscience. And I, I, I had to say to my father, look, you. You said in my intervention that you wanted me to make choices. You wanted to know that I was making choices. And I want to do this. And he, he couldn't say, we can't at that point. So I did. But it was very therapeutic for me to help others to get out. As I was meeting with Moonies, 
and hearing them parrot the exact same sentences that I had parroted. You know, each time I was working with someone, I was exiting another piece of me. So it was a very therapeutic process, and and uh, and I also made a, a, a conscious decision at a certain point of well, I spent two and a half years in, I'll spend two and a half years fighting them, and I naively thought that I could get rid of the Moonies. <laughs> it's been a very long two and a half. Yeah, yeah. Um, at least Moon is dead, and his sons are fighting for the for the empire. <laughs> so how are we doing on time? I think we've run out. So thank you so much for coming.